Cool. Introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Matt. Um, you may have been here for a raffle talk a few months ago. I was doing that one. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I've only got I'll hit some. I've only got a short amount of time, so this is a pretty like broad topic. So it's hard to figure out what to talk about. So I'm just going to kind of make it up as I go. Um, uh, so I've got an AI startup, and we like to use JavaScript. Um, so uh, in the future, maybe not right now. Um, primarily doing machine vision stuff. Uh, so I thought I'd just to keep this JavaScript related. I was just going to explain not exactly what we're doing, uh, or not in detail, but just go over the problems we're attacking. Um, and then I was going to talk about what we do our experiments in, which is an Electron-based uh, application. And uh, so, yeah, this is the name of our startup. Um, and I've just got some random neural net pictures off Google Images. Uh, who has like, played with neural nets to any kind of degree before? Cool. So lots of you don't know how they work. It'll take way too long to explain. I'll just give a quick rundown. Um, a neural net's just a way that you feed in some information, and your goal is to transform that information in some way that makes some job or some requirement you have useful. That's, that's pretty much it. So in this picture here, you just, I know you might do image classification, so you want to see that the picture of this beer bottle means beer bottle. Um, so you feed in the image, the left-hand side, it does a bunch of stuff. And on the right-hand side, you'll get an output that hopefully is desirable to what you need to be done. But just think of these as a huge block of numbers. All those lines there would represent numbers. And your goal is to find a set of those numbers that solves your problem, essentially. Um, let me just see what else I've got. Uh, yeah, this will do. So. Um, this is just another random one grabbed off the net. Uh, basically, anything you've seen, like any vision recognition stuff you've seen before, uses today uh, convolutional neural nets. Um, there's all different kinds of uh, sub-architectures within that uh, genre, but they all apply the same kind of idea. And essentially, same thing, you feed in an input, and out the back you want the blue area to tell you what it is. And so this, you show, show it a beer bottle, the system gets it wrong, thinks it's a giraffe. You tweak the system slightly so that the next time you show a beer bottle, it'll be a little bit more likely to give you the correct answer. Now, what you don't hear about is these are hugely problematic. They have um, yeah, big issues. Um, a few of those, uh, they need a lot of labels. And what that means is if you want one of these systems to learn how to see beer bottles, you need a lot of beer bottles and each of those images needs to be labeled that it is a beer bottle. Um, that's why these kind of systems are currently only really accessible to big companies like Google, because they've got the manpower or money to build these really diverse data sets uh, that are highly labeled. Um, I don't know if, you, if any of you know the ImageNet data set, for example, it has a lot of images pre-labeled so you can train these kinds of systems. So what we do, oh, other problems, sorry. Um, because you need a lot of labels, uh, you've got the problem where any domain where you don't have the labels at hand become impossible to train a good system on. And you also have the problem of these systems being locked. So if you have a thousand things you want to be able to see and you've got the data to, see, to uh, train systems to see these thousand things, then um, you're fine. But if you want to learn a thousand and one things, even if you have that extra one set of data, you need to restart, you need to redesign the network, retrain it um, with everything that you originally did before to make it work. Whereas humans, we know we can just you know, see something we've never seen before and someone say, that's a different kind of cat, and you go, sweet, and then you know that kind of cat. Um, the other problem these networks have is due to the choice of training algorithm, the one that everybody commonly uses, which is backprop, everything inside that red line uh, inside the red box is basically uh, an unknown. So the systems, even the systems that you see using your phone today, even the audio recognition stuff you might get with Siri or Google Voice or Google Now, uh, they have the problem that the engineers don't technically know how they work. They know how to train the systems to work, they know how to minimize their necessary objective, but what you get in that red box at the end, the solution, is just essentially 
a big block of numbers, that doesn't tell you much. So when you look at things like uh, insurance companies and uh, financial institutions, they currently are reluctant to use these kind of methods because the stuff in the red box is unknown. So if a system might be good at telling whether or not they should loan you some money, but if the bank can't say why the system said you weren't, then they don't find that very useful. So these are some big issues and that's what our group's trying to tackle. Um, but I'm not gonna go into that now because that's a huge, huge topic uh, and I'll um, maybe for another time in the future. Um, so, well, we, we do a lot of experiments using Electron. Who here has used Electron? Anyone? No, not many? Oh, okay. Who here knows what Electron is then? Do I, should I explain that? I don't know, most people do. If you don't, uh, it's just think a browser combined with Node. Um, get all the goodness of both. Uh, I think Slack's implemented, the native apps implemented in Electron, uh, Atom, Google, uh, Microsoft Code, I think. Can't quite remember. Um, is it Visual Studio Code? Yep. Yeah. Cool. So uh, we built the Electron app to do our experiments, and this is the structure of it right here. I don't know if you can see it properly. Uh, you essentially just create a config, um, and you can think of these systems just like this picture here as a layered set of stuff that gets done. That's that's as abstract as you need to understand it. Um, so you define a config that has a bunch of layers. And you have a, also a list of renderers that take data from the layers and output that data. Uh, basically, these systems are really hard to work with because unlike traditional programming, where you think of your path you want to go, so you want to get from A to B, you do divide and conquer, you break your problem down, and you just write code, you can write tests to achieve that. These kind of uh, machine learning systems uh, have this extra element. It's like you're trying to do C, but you do it by coding A and B. And C is sometimes quite elusive, and the result you get is quite difficult to understand. Um, so I'll show you what this kind of looks like. So I'll just bring up a simple... Um, so this is just like one of the config files we use. You just define an array of layers, an array of renderers. Um, you can build any layers you like, any renderers you like. They just have to adhere to a couple of pretty small constraints. Uh, a layer just needs to output, uh, we'll just have to write to an output tensor. The tensor is just like a multi dimensional array. Um, and renderers just need to pull data from somewhere and then it can do what it wants with it. So if I just. Uh, where are we? Right, so if you see here this config, I'm just running an input type called white and patches. Um, I'll just show you what that does. It just pulls some. Um, White and pre white and patches. White and you don't need to know what that is. It's just something that the human eye does to images before it passes that data through. It's sort of like an edge detector. Um, so I will just. Oops. So the reason we use Electron is because. I get all the goodness of a browser for doing visualizations. We can do Canvas or WebGL. I love having the um, source code and the debugger right there with me, so I kind of treat this like an IDE, um, sort of like a Visual Studio for JavaScript, I guess. Um, primarily, I love the fact that Electron lets you access I.O., and you can also write C code or C++ code and create a bridge so you can get access to anything extra you need through uh, uh, the node side. Um, so this is just some a few little demos I thought I would show. They're, they're toy demos, they're not what we're doing. Um, where are we? Okay, I don't have, this one's not an architecture that I've got in the slide. Uh, so basically those pictures you saw before, this is just taking tiny 16 by 16 patches of that picture, and it's creating a bunch of neuron, neurons that are learning through Hebian learning, uh, essentially the same sorts of things the first layer of your brain learns when you're looking at the world as a baby. Um, it takes a while to train, um, uh, but if I load, I don't remember what I called it. Um, it learns basically edges of different angles and stuff. If you uh, did an MRI, uh, fMRI or you 
put in some probes into your neurons in the back of your brain. Uh, this is the kinds of outputs you would get uh, from neurons in there. So that's just a really simple demo. Um, let me pull up something else. So show you some of the architectures. Uh, this one here is called uh, Matching Pursuit. It builds up, it would search us through data and builds up a sparse dictionary. Basically, that means a dictionary of parts. If I was to tell, ask you to describe me how to draw a nine, you might say a vertical line and a round bit that sits up the top, and I'll be like, okay, I understand. So this is a system, a, a network, network architecture that extracts those kind of parts by looking at a digit data set. So I'll just show you that. So this is a pretty large dictionary. It'll take a while to train. As you can see, it would take a while. Um, I had one earlier. So this builds a part dictionary up, and if we step through the data, you'll see that uh, here's a six, and here is the four parts from the dictionary. It's decided are the best parts to reconstruct that six, and here is the six down the bottom. Now, uh, how useful these, not super useful, but um, in that in this form, but I just thought it was a cool example to show. Um, basically, this is saying, look at the data, and build me a dictionary of things that describe the data in the most general way that's useful to reconstruct them. If you're familiar with autoencoders, uh, it's doing something similar, but with local learning. Um, what else have I got? So this is an example of what's called lateral in inhibitive uh, sparse compression, it's similar to the last thing, but it uses a connection motif that the brain in theory uses. Basically, you create sheets of neurons, and each individual neuron fit gets fed by the input and so on, except the difference is each neuron is laterally connected to its neighbors in, in an inhibitive way, which means they I guess you can think of them as competing for resources. And this system builds up a compressed representation uh, of the data. So I've got uh, this data set here, which is uh, Omniglot, which is large sets of these really crazy, interesting characters, different languages. Um, and so you can think we have literally thousands of characters, um, and we've just got 100 neurons to try and learn their representation. Um, which you can think of as a compression, and this will take a little while to train, but I reload. You see here, the system, it's not great because it's trying to compress a huge number of stuff, but it's able in the same way to reconstruct the data, um, at least somewhat okay. Um, so this is just an example of using your own to do compression. Um, cool. And then lastly, I've got this architecture show, which is a self-organized map. Um, this isn't really utilized today, but it's really cool visually because um, that's why I put it here. It's nice to show. Um, let me find that one. Um, it's called Song. So what this does is it looks at the data and it tries to build what's called a manifold. Just think of it as uh, all the possible uh, data points there are, like all the digits in the set, it just tries to build a sheet that wraps around the space in a way where two places on the sheet that are close will represent two digits that are close by whatever the closeness uh, metric you're using is. If we just let this one go for like a few seconds. Basically it's trying to understand, or trying to figure out uh, how to transition, like if you look at the top corner, starting to see what kinds of threes uh, should be grouped together, and as you move in any direction, they'll start transitioning to different digits. They'll start incorporating more um, as the thing goes. I'll just let it run a little bit longer. Uh, yeah, but it's, I've got to put it in the config. I haven't got a the command plus working in here right now. I turned it off. 
Uh, so to get a better idea of what this is actually doing, um, people used to use it for clustering. Um, I will just put a different visual one together. Now this is the exact same network, just with a different um, a different data set. So instead of giving it digits, which are 28 by 28, 784 dimensions, I'm just going to give it two-dimensional points. And so it's just going to randomly fill this sheet with two-dimensional points. And then uh, just like the last demo, if you think of each of those digits you saw as a point on the surface, it will try and learn the surface that best matches the data. So if I can... So what this will do is just showing the two-dimensional data will take a bunch of points that only know what their neighbors are doing and slowly learn to uh, cover the data space in the best way that it can figure out, literally by pulling the neighbors in different directions. Uh, to let it run for a bit, it should figure out um, the right representation. So this is basically just figured out how do I um, how do I find the correct surface, and so it's it's figured out given these random two D points what the best surface is that can represent that point set. I had a uh, it's it doesn't fill the extents because I've got a strong uh, neighborhood tugging on just so it trained really quickly so you guys can see it happening in action. Um, I know these are like really out of context, um, and so they don't have any practical use for you, but. Um, uh, the point was just that we've, yeah, we're using JavaScript and Electron to create these really simple configs of different layers, and we just code different layer types. So uh, we just look at um, the antihelion layer. We just have a propagate and a learn function that says how to update the data in whatever way. And as it, because it adheres to this idea that it needs to fill an output tensor, you can stack these layers. So you can think of it as like a, a data flow, where each layer just does something to the data and outputs it. And it makes it really easy for us to do experiments, because we can think we just have the data source in there. We can just create a new layer or edit an older layer and perform some kind of computation and have a renderer look at that data and display it in some way we like um, so that it helps us understand and debug what we're trying to do. Um, cool, I'm almost out of time. Um, hopefully that wasn't super boring. <laughs> uh, thanks, any questions? They were like the data points. So that was the ones they're trying to map. Just think of them as randomly assigned. If you had to put them in a cluster, like in set, say up in the corner, then the sheet would have filled up the space around that corner. It's just a you know, super toy example. Um, does that have a C back end? Uh, this one, no. Um, right now, because we're doing algorithmic <laughs> research, we don't need to use real world data sets, so we don't really need to use GPUs or anything yet. So um, that's on the cards for later, but we still need to toss up whether or not this is what we actually want to use to do real data and not TensorFlow or one of the other um, tools that are actually good for doing big data sets. Have you actually learned any of the, I don't know, like I said, I don't really know what I'm talking about, but the stuff really under the covers that actually does the stuff have you implemented any of that sort of stuff, or is it just more feeding in and... Yeah, everything there we, we put together, yeah. Awesome. Can you, is it, yeah, okay. um, so we just put this on GitHub. I don't know why you would use it. Uh, our primarily reason for putting it, make it public is we're going to be writing papers and doing some demos in the near future. Uh, so we wanted something there that we could funnel the demos through so people could be... Uh, scrutinize us and do their own tests and that sort of thing. Um, so we just put that up today. It's like a slimmed down version of what we're working with. We'll just keep adding to it. So if anybody had any ideas, that'd be cool. But my other really big drive for this stuff is machine learning just is not accessible to the average coder. Most people who are in the field do PhDs. They do tons of maths and stats, which sucks. Um, so part of our goal is to not only uh, solve some really good problems, but try and make this stuff more accessible. 
So the point of me talking today was that we'll be starting a blog soon and uh, we'll be putting out code as often as we can to try and chronologically get through some really simple things, building up to ideas that might help some of you guys in the future doing something that you haven't thought of yet. Do you use feature selection for training or do you use all the features? Uh, it depends what we're working on. Yeah. So it's not generated, but for each specific problem you have yeah, uh, the idea here is that there's no specific algorithm utilized. The thing's tr tr trying to be general in that if you have, if you want to implement uh, something off the shelf, you can add it into a layer and just feed your data. And just think of it in the same sense as most of these. Um, uh, <laughs> how do I stop this guy? Sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, just think of it as a data flow system. Uh, so you probably could use it for other interesting things. I just like it because we don't need this for the web, um, and it's it's just quick to develop in because we can I can just write something in Sublime, refresh Electron, debug from in there, log stuff to the console, um, use canvases or OpenGL, and it's it's nice. Yeah. So, what are some of the examples? What are some examples of some projects that you guys are working on? Can you give a quick summary or something? Uh, yeah. Sorry. I tried to at the start. Basically, we're just tack tackling the problems of needing a lot of data to train current confidence. Um, so, uh, it's a bit of a split field. The the stuff that works right now is what everybody does. So we're sort of controversial in that we're trying algorithms that are a bit more on the edge side of things. Um, we like the idea of local learning versus backprop. So uh, current systems, they use an algorithm called backprop. Basically, you take these stacks of layers, you figure out uh, an error of what you want it to happen, and then you go backwards through the network and just shuffle it slightly using this algorithm to update. By doing that, you're neglecting what's happening internally. You're saying, I don't care what happens inside it, I just care what's happening at the end. And so what you do is you get your objective solved, but that's all you can do with this system. We're looking at what happens if you cut that top end off, what happens if we have no objective, other than trying to learn a good representation that's useful. So we're working with um, different kinds of uh, newer algorithms, that are uh, loosely inspired by the brain to try and learn things in a greedy, layer-wise way, sort of a forward fashion, using local rules. Yeah. Last one? How do you know when to stop? Yeah. Uh, it depends on the problem. Um, certain algorithms converge, others don't. Um, it just yeah, it really depends. Depends on the data. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, sorry, if you're interested in this stuff in any way, shape, or form, uh, please contact me just out of interest. It's something I think, um, yeah, I think people would find useful in the future and maybe want to get involved somehow would be really cool. Awesome. And you've got your details there on the screen. Yeah, just Twitter's fine. Cool. You guys contact me.